moving moving on from 8.1 rotational kinematics we zoom out we finish talking about more rotational kinematics we go we move from kinematics to dynamics all this while over here we are talking all about the kinematics we have finished talking about how the things move so now we want to move on to talk about why the thing moves the way it moves we move to dynamics okay so let's zoom in and talk about dynamics for rotation okay when a force is exerted at a distance from the axis of rotation what does it mean is if you have an object over here this is an object if the object has an axis of rotation and you exert a force which is all these arrow colorful arrows i'm just giving many examples of different ways of exerting a force so when force is exerted at a distance okay the force will be denoted by f the distance will be r from the axis of rotation you can calculate something called So torque is basically just R cross F. Okay, what does it mean by R cross F? If you refer to chapter one, you can break it down into R F sine theta. Okay, R sine theta means by we are looking for the perpendicular component of force. Okay, we are looking for the component of force which is perpendicular to the distance. Okay, so let me give you an example. If you have an object that looks like this, then you have your axis of rotation like this. You have an axis of rotation over here, and you are exerting a force, let's say, towards here then this will be the distance from the axis of rotation and this will be the force but since we have an f sine theta here what it means is you only want the component which is perpendicular to r f sine theta we also call it f perpendicular you don't want the whole force you only want the component of force perpendicular to the distance from the axis of rotation then you multiply these two things together and you attach the sign it's either positive or negative okay, that's the idea behind torque why is there positive or negative because torque has direction so what kind of direction do we have if it's positive then it's clockwise if it's negative it's clockwise how do you determine whether it's positive or negative I use the right hand palm rule this is from chapter one or you use your common sense okay why do I say common sense let's look back at this force over here if you are exerting a force pushing downwards and you fix this point and fix this point sure the object will be turning downward right maybe turning like this if it's turning like this then this direction will just be a clockwise direction if it's clockwise direction then reasonably you put a negative sign for top so it's actually common sense so uh, since I say it's common sense, I'll move to this diagram over here so we can see why do I say it's common sense. Okay, first of all, this equation here, this equation here mentions that the 
force is perpendicular. Without perpendicular force, you cannot have any uh, torque. So if my axis of rotation is here, my axis of rotation is here, these forces here will have zero torque because they are not perpendicular to the distance from the axis of rotation. These are all parallel with R. So in that case, the torque will be zero. Okay, now let's move on and talk about if the force is exerted on the axis of rotation, means that all this pink pink arrow they are exerted on the axis of rotation, right? If they are exerted on the axis of rotation, the R will be zero. If the R will be zero, the torque will be zero as well. Okay, so we have determined many zero. Let's move on to talk about the direction, plus or minus. Let's look at these three arrows up here first. If you have these three forces, these three types of forces being exerted, and you have your axis of rotation on your right, the thing will be going in that direction, right? If that's the direction, if you draw a full circle, that is clockwise. So this will be negative, negative, negative. Then for the things down there, for these three forces down here, these three forces, if you exert these three downward forces, either one of them, and your axis of rotation is on your right, the object will be turning in this direction, right? If you turn in this direction, you imagine a full circle that will be anti-clockwise direction. So this will be positive. Okay, um, so that's how you determine the direction for the torque. Continue. If you look at these three forces here, if you are exerting an upward force and your axis of rotation is on your left, you can imagine that the things will be moving this way. Moving this way, if you draw a full circle going this way, it's anti-clockwise. So anti-clockwise means by it's positive. So using the same logic, down here will be negative. Okay, so don't really need any kind of right hand rule or screw or whatever. It's just common sense. You can if you cannot imagine that right, you can hold a pen. Then you fix the position at the axis rotation. Then you try to push according to the direction of the force. Then you see where which direction the, the pen turns. If it turns anti-clockwise, then it's positive torque. If it turns, neg uh, turns clockwise, then it's negative torque. Okay? Don't really need any kind of hand rule actually. Okay? So that's what happens if you have forces being exerted at a distance from the axis of rotation. So that's all for the blue box. Now, if you have multiple forces, if you have multiple forces, in chapter four, if you have multiple forces, you try to find the resultant force by building the free body diagram first. Now in chapter eight, you'll be doing a similar thing. If you have multiple forces being exerted at different points on the body, means by here is one point, another point, another point, another point. At different points, you have different forces being exerted. What you can do is you can draw free body diagram like this. For the free body diagram, you represent the object with a straight line. You don't need to draw a bar or something. Just a straight line will do. Then you label the forces at different points where the force are exerted. Just label the forces. Okay, so that's how you draw a free body diagram. We do more practice in our tutorial later. Okay, so once you have finished drawing your free body diagram, you can check 
based on the question whether the thing is moving or rotating or not. Let me zoom out a little bit. Okay, so what you can do is you can check whether the thing is moving or rotating or not. Whether whether it's moving or rotating or not. If an object is not moving and it's not rotating, we call this situation as static equilibrium. Static means by not moving. Okay, when it's under static equilibrium, you can use these three equations to study your object. The first one is the sum of torque is equal to zero. That means by the, uh, the amount of torque trying to turn it clockwise is the same as the amount of torque trying to turn it anti-clockwise. Just like your in chapter 4, the force pointing upwards is cancelled off by the force pointing downwards. In chapter 8, it's the anti-clockwise torque cancel out the clockwise torque. That's why the sum of torque is equal to zero. The sum of torque, we can call it resultant torque as well. Okay? And if a thing is not moving, it's just what you learned in chapter 4. Sum of fx is equal to zero. Sum of fy is equal to zero. So using these three equations, and you slowly construct the system, you'll be able to solve any static equilibrium question. Okay? So that wraps up chapter 8.2 on talk. Now, if we move on to the right hand side, if it's moving with an acceleration or rotating with an angular acceleration, you technically enter 8.3, which is rotational dynamics. When you're in this situation, the object is not in equilibrium. Means by your sum of torque is not equal to zero or your sum of f is not equal to zero. If it's not equal to zero, you can apply the Newton's second law. f equals ma for the linear situation. Sum of torque equals to i alpha for rotational cases. So it means by you have, sorry, you have angular acceleration, only you can apply this situation, not in equilibrium. Okay, so for any kind of situation, it's important that you are able to differentiate whether it's case one, static equilibrium, or case two, not in equilibrium. Then only you start to solve the question. If you are in case one, you use these three equations, uh, these three equations on static equilibrium. If you are in case two, you know that it's not in equilibrium, you use sum of top equals to i alpha or sum of f equals to ma. So that sums up 8.2 on talk. We will move on to 8.3 on rotational dynamics. We learn more about moment of inertia.